All right, so welcome everyone. This is the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge webinar. Um, we're going to be going from 12.15 to 1.15. Um, and then after um, about 1.15, we're going to have a technical support hour. Um, so any questions regarding IMAP invasives, um, we will be able to answer them for you for about an hour. Um, so, you know, hold your any, you know, technical questions to the end. Um, we are joined by a few presenters here. My name is Emma Antolis. I'm the Invasive Species Education Outreach Coordinator for DEC. We're also joined by Anna Stapson from Yale University. Um, we also have uh, Jennifer Dean from IMAP Invasives and Meg Wilkinson from IMAP Invasives as well. All right, so the goals of this webinar today, um, we want you to leave um, today knowing how to identify jumping worm, water chestnut, and tree of heaven. Um, these are three underreported invasive species in New York State. Um, we also want you to utilize IMAP Invasive Database and make observations out in the field. And we want you to go and participate in our mapping challenge, which runs from today, June 26th through Ju July 17th. Uh, last year, we um, I think we started in July, so we're kind of starting a little bit earlier to give folks more time. I think it was like three weeks or so, um, so you have lots more time to participate. So here's a basic outline of today. So if you want to just take a take note of who is presenting when, if you want to kind of tune in or tune out when you want to, um, here's the rundown. So we're going to do a little bit of an intro now, um, followed by our jumping worm identification, then a tree of heaven identification, followed by water chestnut. And then um, around 1250, uh, we're going to be talking about how to utilize IMAP invasives. And then we're going to be doing that wrap up and technical support, so answering any questions you might have. All right, so let's get started. So I'm going to talk about this very briefly because I'm sure all of you are well familiar, um, but invasive species are non-native plants, animals, insects, and pathogens that cause harm to the environment, the economy, and human health. Um, so this is a big issue in New York State. Um, and we have something called the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, or PRISMS, um, that were created across New York State. Um, there are eight of them um, to address these issues um, from invasive species. So here are your local PRISMS here. We have the Long Island um, PRISM, Lower Hudson PRISM, the Capital Mohawk PRISM, APIP in the Adirondacks, Lilo in the St. Lawrence, Eastern Lake Ontario, we have the Catskill Prism, Finger Lakes Prism, and the Western New York Prism. So every county in New York State is represented by one of these eight prisms. Um, prisms do a wider range of activities, including management. They implement prevention programs. They conduct surveillance and mapping of invasive species infestations. Um, they're doing early detection and rapid response. Um, they are also doing habitat restoration and monitoring, and they do so much more. Um, but in the interest of time, I wanted to keep it short. So um, definitely, if you're not already aware, check out your local prism. Sign up for the and sign up for the listserv so you can get lots of updates on what they're doing and um, how you can volunteer. So the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge, um, why we're here today, um, is the goal is to uh, get people to fill in the data gaps in IMAP Invasive, New York's Invasive Species Database. Um, so we're focusing on these three species here, water chestnut and aquatic invasive. Um, we have Asian jumping worm in the middle there, which is a terrestrial issue, and uh, tree of heaven, which is an invasive tree. Why are we focusing on these three species? Um, the reasons are pretty simple, actually. So water chestnut, um, if found in a small population, you can actually very easily monitor and remove um, these populations. They're very easy to pull up. We don't want that second photo to happen. So you see that vast mat of water chestnut. Um, if you catch it early, you can prevent that from happening. Um, so we want to know where these kind of smaller populations are. Um, and there's definitely a lack of data in IMAP invasives. Um, as for Asian jumping worm, there's also not a lot of data available in New York State. Um, and um, it is here. We just don't know to what extent. Same with all of these invasives. Um, so that's why we're you know, bringing them to light and getting people like yourself to go out and report them. 
Um, and with Asian jumping worm, because it's kind of, uh, it can inform, if we know where uh, it is and where the populations are, we can actually help inform uh, decisions. So where we should be putting boot brush stations, at trailheads, where we should be focusing our conservation efforts, et cetera. So this data is really good um, for us to have so we can you know, move forward and know how to plan ahead. As for Tree of Heaven, um, so many of you guys are aware of our new um, big bat invader, spotted lanternfly. Uh, it's a destructive invasive insect from Asia that feeds on more than 70 different plant species. Um, so Tree of Heaven has been around for quite some time. I think it's one of those forgotten um, species that people don't look at anymore. But now with spotted lanternfly preferring it as a host, people are reevaluating. We want to know where that tree of heaven is so we can, you know, in the future, if we do have a spotted lanternfly um, infestation that we know where to look for it. And again, there's not a lot of data inputted into IMAP regarding tree of heaven. It's been here for quite some time. And I think, again, it's uh, one of those um, invasives from that people kind of neglect to see anymore. So to give you an idea of some of the entries into IMAP, so again, this is just user data. So people who are putting um, where they have found water chestnut into IMAP. So this is not indicative of actually where in, um, all water chestnut is across New York State. Um, so as you can see, there's probably some areas that you're like, yeah, I'm probably pretty sure that there are some water chestnuts. So for instance, these are two huge gaps you know, in Western New York, you have a significant population and kind of in the Finger Lakes, but what's going on in that area in the Southern Tier or where, what about in that area of Binghamton? So um, are these areas where there actually is no water chestnut or is this just a, da a gap in data? Is no one gone out there to survey or is no one bothered to report it? Um, so kind of similar instances with um, jumping worm. So you see there's not a ton of um, data, that doesn't mean it's not in New York, you know, not widespread throughout New York State. Um, so yeah, you have these big swaths of um, area here that we just don't know. So um, we, again, are encouraging you guys to get out and report these three species. Same thing with Tree of Heaven. We know it's definitely much more widespread than this. Um, so this is, again, huge gaps. Actually, they seem to be very similar spots um, now that I'm thinking about it. So we definitely want to encourage you guys um, in those areas, especially, you know, in the southern tier um, near um, Lake Ontario there um, to start reporting these species and presence absence. Um, so how do you participate in this challenge? So we want you to enter your observations into the IMAP database. So you just literally have to report whether or not it's present or absent. So if it's there or if it's not, pretty simple. Um, the reporting window is June 26th through the July 17th. Um, and that's again during Invasive Species Awareness Week, um, which is July 7th through the 13th. Um, and we just want you to look in your backyard or nearby, a park, um, you know, lake, et cetera. If you're on vacation in another part of the state, take a look and, and let us know what you're finding. Prizes are gonna be awarded to um, the folks, the individuals who report the greatest numbers of observations. Um, so that again is present or absent. Um, and the prism who has the most um, entries will actually win one of these fun little trophies there. So you see the trophies on the bottom as well as the prizes. So the prizes are pretty sweet in my opinion. Um, you got some cool books and, and other supplies. So this is very, very cool. Um, again, I mentioned um, this is part of a larger Invasive Species Awareness Week campaign. All right, so I think I will turn it over to Anis. Um, do you mind sharing your screen? Yep, I'm getting it set up right now. Can you hear me okay? How is my sound? Uh, we can hear you okay. And can you see it okay? Yes, we can. All right. Well, then I'll jump right in. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to start you guys out with just a very, very brief um, introduction to jumping worms for those of you that don't know too much about it yet. Um, in New York State, our forests mainly have established without earthworms since the last glaciation. 
Um, now, this map here in the pink is showing the known areas of native earthworms. Um, more recently, we've found some up into New York State, uh, but for the most part, the worms that you're interacting with on the day-to-day -day are going to be um, European species, and then more recently, um, Asian species. And so uh, what we're looking at right, right now is um, jumping worms. So they are a new invasion that followed the colonization by European species. And um, while they are also earthworms, like the European species, they are in a different family, so they're quite different. Um, the tricky thing about them is they can be very hard to tell apart, and they invade together. So there's 16 species that we know of in North America right now, um, and five that are moving into forests. Um, in New York State, it's about, it's sort of three species that are um, co-invading. And you may have heard them by all sorts of different names. Um, the scientific names, mega, mega, megascolecids, or phoretomoid worms, um, Jersey or New Jersey wigglers, Alabama jumpers, Georgia jumpers, all of those are very confusing because their origin is not New Jersey, not Alabama, not Georgia. Um, you may have also heard them called snake worms. They have kind of snake-like behavior, crazy worms or Asian worms, but we are, because they have so many different names, we're sort of trying to come together to one shared name, jumping worms, that as you'll see is pretty descriptive of them. So they, uh, they're fairly new on the scene in forests, but they have been in the area um, in greenhouses as far back as the 1940s um, in, in and around New York, uh, New York City. Um, they were noticed in the wild in the 1980s in New York and Connecticut, uh, southwestern Connecticut. And one thing that's really uh, sort of goes to show what an active invasion it is, is there's only one confirmed sighting in Canada. So New York is kind of the barrier between very high invasion in New York City to almost completely uninvaded um, as you get towards the Canadian border. If you look in this picture here, the dark gray, those are the areas um, that jumping worms could possibly in invade based on, their, um, uh, based on their habitat requirements. And this is, it's going on in New York State, we're focused in New York State, but it, it is an invasion happening globally. So if you go to the Galapagos, if you go to Brazil, um, uh, Europe, they all have these invasive jumping worms moving in. And what makes them so invasive? We don't, it, the, the short answer is we don't really know for, sh for sure yet. We don't have a definitive answer, but they are unique in several ways. Um, they have a very flexible diet. They grow extremely quickly. Um, they also can uh, reproduce parthenogenetically, which means that they can just clone themselves essentially and don't need to reproduce sexually. Um, they're fairly flexible in their habitat requirements. They, uh, they have some sort of mysterious mass migration behavior. And they have cocoon banks that are long lived and um, can withstand some pretty big climate extremes. They also have a lot of genetic diversity. And so some of these hypotheses, um, the data that you generate about where they are, um, can help us sort of answer some of these questions. Their impacts, this is another thing that we don't have a ton of information about yet. But if you look at this picture here that I have on the left, you'll see a schematic of um, a relatively uninvaded forest. And so you'll see that the soil is very stratified. There's a lot of organic material at the top. Um, there's a lot of diversity of soil fauna and of plants. Um, when, when the European species moved in, they mixed that up and um, incorporated the forest floor, the organic horizon, into subsequent layers. And so all of that habitat is lost for um, the soil food web, including the plants and the other critters. With jumping worms, we're still figuring out what that looks like, what that third panel of jumping worm invasion looks like. But certainly we know that they um, change the soil to having a really granular texture, kind of like coffee grounds or like gravel. And so that is um, extremely difficult for plants to grow in without desiccating and um, the stability of the soil is very, very low. So there's a lot of erosion um, and drying out. 
So um, other things that, that we hypothesize will be negatively affected by jumping worms based on what we know about the European species is that when you lose the, um, the forest floor habitat, you lose the ground nesting birds that um, rely on that for, um, for nest protection. Um, I mentioned briefly at the beginning that we're just starting to recognize the importance of um, some native earthworms in these forests. And so we really don't know what jumping worms are doing to these very understudied native earthworm communities. Um, we suspect that they are negatively affecting fungi, the rest of the soil food web that relies on, um, on the habitat, and they're also accumulating toxic oils. So all sorts of problems there. Um, so what you need to know is how to identify them. It's tricky to identify them for a number of reasons. Um, they have a relatively short life cycle, they're annuals, so you can only see them um, during the summer months, and you can only see them as adults during the sort of later summer, early fall months. Um, so we have to be a little bit creative in what we're looking for. Um, so I'm gonna give you um, a suite of things that you can look at to identify jumping worms, and uh, many of them are not the worms themselves, so keep that in mind. Um, if you look at the soil, that can give you a ton of information about what kind of earthworms are there without even seeing the worms. So on the far left, you have um, a real picture of that cartoon schematic I showed you before, where you have a thick organic horizon. And then in the middle, you have a very mixed organic, um, organic horizon with a European invasion. And then on the right, there's that sort of coffee ground, gravelly texture that jumping worms make. And it's really, really distinctive um, when their populations get really high. So if you see that, that's a very good sign, even if you don't see the worms themselves, that, that you've got them. Another thing that you can do is you can look for the worms if you're in that window sort of starting now and going into the early fall. And they're gonna be, they're not going to be very deep in the soil. They live right sort of um, on the leaf litter or just below. And so if you're doing an IMAP entry, um, one thing that you might do is try a sample in your backyard or in a more urban or suburban area and in a natural area and see if you, um, see if there's any difference between those areas. All right, the behavior is a really, really clear one. We've got the jumping worm on the left and the European worm on the right. And so, you can see they're sort of on the, the jumping worms, they're back and forth thrashing behavior and they move along the soil. That's how they get the, the, the name snake worm, right? And then the European species, they're moving by expanding and contracting their setae. Um, so this, this difference in behavior is really, really a strong indicator of what kind of species you have. So another tip for including in your um, submission to IMAP is to submit a picture of that soil um, if you've got the gravelly texture and include a little note about whether you observe this thrashing behavior. Um, they're, they are kind of hard to tell apart just, just by the naked eye. The night crawler versus the jumping room in late summer, they're both really big, very dark, kind of iridescent. So that can be tricky, but if they are reproductive, they'll have a clitellum. So on the left, we've got the jumping worms. The clitellum goes all the way around and it's kind of like a corset, um, sort of pulls in the earthworm a little bit. Whereas the big night crawler, um, it's clitellum, that's the reproductive part that you see about um, a third of the way down from the worm's head. It's going to be more like an inner tube or like a life jacket or a saddle kind of comes out a little bit puffy and mostly on the back of the worm. Um, if you're feeling really keen, if you're a real natural historian, you can bring out your hand lens and look at the setae. So these are small hair-like um, appendages that are on the, um, on the segments of the worm. The European species, they'll have maybe about um, four to 10 setae visible around each segment. And they're often gonna be in pairs, either close or widely spaced. Whereas the jumping worms have these bristle-like, that one you have to look a little bit harder, that's on the left, these really small bristle-like setae. 
So that's helpful if they're, if they're not reproductive. If you wanna be quantitative, you can do um, mustard sampling, mixing just one third of a cup ground mustard per one gallon of water, pour that on the soil. Um, and if you keep your, your sampling consistent, then you can get a nice quantitative number and you can um, fix them in ethanol and actually ident ident identify them to species. And for those of you that are very keen on challenging yourselves, um, this is the name of the, the best, the only uh, jumping worm key um, for North America. So uh, Asian phoretomoid earthworms in North America, north of Mexico by Chang. Uh, but that, that stuff is all extra, that's just for fun. Um, but what we really want is the data from IMAP invasives. So if you can find it, it's going to be a little bit challenging at this time of year to find a mature specimen with a clitellum. That's the reproductive structure um, that creates a band, either a corset or an inner tube. Um, but if you can find it, that's great. Include a picture of the soil granules, like I mentioned. Write a little note about their behavior. Make sure it's a good resolution photo. And one thing that can be really helpful is putting in an item for scale that we can look at. Um, contrasting background, maybe if you have a white piece of paper or a white takeout container, that can be really helpful. Um, a straight worm is much easier for us to identify. And although they get to very, very high densities and you might be tempted to pick up a whole batch of them to send, it's much easier to see if you only send a couple rather than um, all 20 or 200 that you collect. A really quick summary here. Um, all that you need for the IMAP submission is to um, inspect the soil for the granular appearance and note the thrashing behavior. If you can send in that plus your picture, we'll almost certainly be able to confirm that it's a jumping worm. Um, if you want to get a little bit more ambitious, look for the clitellum, um, pull your hand lens out, look for the bristle like setae. And if you're really, really keen, you can get out your dissecting scope follow that key that I mentioned, or if you're really, really keen, you can do a genetic analysis. Um, and so I will leave it at that for now, and I think we're gonna do questions at the end. Thank you, guys. Um, now we are going to move into our Tree of Heaven identification, and we have Jen Dean, and then, yep. Okay, can everyone see that screen okay? All right. All right, we're gonna go ahead. All right, great. Um, jumping on to another species for our mapping challenge, Tree of Heaven. Uh, this is a species that is native to central China and Taiwan and was introduced to the US for ornamental purposes. Early records indicate that it was first brought to Pennsylvania back in 1784. And then another importation occurred to New York in 1820. And then from there, the cat was out of the bag, and um, many more introductions were made, and human-mediated spread occurred throughout the whole country. And so now it's quite widespread and quite established throughout the U.S., um, including Hawaii. It's also in Canada. Um, so it's, it's a species that's been around for a while, and it's uh, here to stay. Um, but let's see. The habitat for this species, sorry, is uh, very wide ranging. So the tree heaven can tolerate poor soils. It grows well in urban settings and it's very drought tolerant. So these are some of the reasons why it has been planted so widely. It is an early successional species. So it's quick to move in after disturbance. And um, in addition to growing in urban settings, it's also known to invade many habitat types. So this includes riparian zones and forest edges. <clears throat> the tree heaven does need open light to grow aggressively, but it can persist in a closed canopy. And so then the species will strike when a gap opens. So a tree falls down or if logging is going through, um, this species has been known to um, quickly invade after a logging um, episode. So tree heaven does grow very aggressively, both in height and in horizontal space. It's uh, Fast-growing root sprouts are its primary means of spreading locally. Um, it does have, but it also has quite a few seeds for long-distance dispersal. 
And it's this dense growth with the sprouts that really crowds out and shades out native species. Um, there's also allelopathic compounds, so com chemical compounds that um, can inhibit the growth of other species um, in Tree of Heaven. And studies have shown that it's been, it can alter soil microbial communities. And in New York State, the invasiveness assessment done in 2009 ranked the species as a moderate invasive. Um, and this was mostly due to the scarcity of documentation of ecological impacts outside of disturbed areas. So most of the, the literature is um, mostly in disturbance zones. The root sprouts can actually damage buildings. So similar to how Japanese knotweed um, growth can, you know, kind of get into the foundation of buildings and houses and so forth, um, tree heaven can also do the same thing. But the main reason that Tree of Heaven has been included in the mapping challenge this summer uh, is that it is the preferred host for the spotted lanternfly. And so even though this presentation is about Tree of Heaven, um, we wanted to take a moment to talk about spotted lanternfly and encourage everyone to also keep an eye out for it. Um, this is a species that's not yet known to be established in New York State. Um, but there is a very large and growing population in Pennsylvania um, in multiple locations, actually. So the outlook is not good. Um, but catching new populations early will help us reduce the impacts of this species. And so what is spotted lanternfly? This is a, a plant hopper. It's native to China and Southeast Asia. As you might remember, that's also the native range of the Tree of Heaven. Um, it was also discovered in Pennsylvania first um, in 2014. So this is a very new invasive species on our continent. It uses its piercing, piercing sucking mouthparts to feed on the sap of more than 70 plant species. Um, as I mentioned, the preferred species is Tree of Heaven, but it will feed aggressively and damage many other species. So this includes grapes, apples, hops, maples, walnuts, sumac, oaks, pines, the list goes on. But um, as many of you probably have um, noticed already, many of these species are very important economic species. So very important agricultural and timber species. Um, and these industries are very concerned about the, the impact of spotted lanternfly on these crops. And so the spotted lanternfly itself is a very um, unique looking species and so it, which helps us in early detection because it is, um, uh, you know, quite distinctive. Uh, the nymphs are, when they're in their first instar, they have, um, they're black with white spots on them. Um, and then as they molt into further instars, the, um, the red coloration starts to appear. Uh, it still does not have its fully formed wings at that point until it transitions into an adult. And so those um, two photos on the right there are showing the adults. Um, they have these beautiful spotted wings. Um, if the wings are spread, um, which you won't necessarily see when they're at rest, but there's very distinctive red coloration underneath the, uh, the, um, the spotted wings. So there's a very bright red and yellow um, coloration there as well. All right, so now back to Tree of Heaven. Uh, this can grow into a really large tree, uh, getting up to 80 feet in height. But it's often, or it's often seen as dense clumps of smaller trees. And so a common theme you'll see me coming back to is that this is very similar to the, our native sumac in appearance and growth form. And so it, it does get mistaken for sumac quite a bit. Oops. One of the identifying characteristics is its alternate leaf arrangements. And um, just a little basic botany, uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, the leaves on plants are typically arranged either as alternate, opposite, or world on the branching itself. And so this does have the alternate structure, so the leaves are coming out on um, alternating sides of the, the stem. And the leaves themselves are pinnately compound. And so once again, I have the little but the botany uh, descriptions up in the upper right hand corner, leaves themselves can be simple where there's just one leaflet uh, attached to the, the twig at the node, um, or leaves can be compound where there's multiple leaflets making up one leaf. So what's pictured here is one leaf of Tree of Heaven with many leaflets 
and you can see those leaflets are oppositely attached to the, the petiole of that leaf. And then zooming into those leaflets, you know, they're kind of triangular shapes. Um, they have one or more rounded teeth at the base, and I'll go into that here in just a moment a little bit more. But the rest of the margin is really smooth. Like there are not additional teeth like a saw blade um, along the, the margin. Um, it is more kind of a blunt base at the bottom and the tip of the, the leaf is tapering. And so here, zooming into that, those uh, teeth down at the bottom of the leaf, so this is the underside of a tree of heaven leaf, and those yellow arrows are pointing to these little glandular dots. And I'll use this characteristic quite a bit out in the field. If I'm not quite sure, I'll flip over the, the leaf and, or the leaflet and see if I can find that little glandular dot at the, the base of the, the leaves where those teeth protrude out. And then that's, you know, pretty, I'm pretty sure at that point that it's tree heaven. The flowers are pretty inconspicuous. Uh, they're white panicles that occur after the leaves have really started pulling out. So they, they really cover up the, the flowers quite a bit unless you're looking for them. Um, the male and female flowers are on separate trees. And then the seeds are large clusters of winged samaras, um, kind of similar to ash trees or um, maple seeds uh, that they can be wind dispersed. And these clusters um, will take on a reddish hue towards the end of the summer, so that will really make them pop out on the landscape. And the bark itself is very smooth. We have these vertical lines um, along the bark, and people have referred to this as cantaloupe skin. So <laughs> thinking about the melon, um, can help you as well. And sorry for my bad photoshopping there, but this along the bark is where you might happen to see spotted lantern fly if there are some in the vicinity. So, you know, keep an eye out um, for those nymphs and adults on the tree. And there are a number of native lookalikes to Tree of Heaven. As I mentioned, sumac is um, commonly misreported as Tree of Heaven. Uh, it does have that pinately compound leaflet, it's alternate leaves as well, um, but it is tooth all the way around. So there's a um, margin all the way around the, the leaves that um, has lots of teeth as opposed to the smooth margin on the tree of heaven. Walnut also um, is mistaken sometimes. Uh, you can notice the, the tapering base as opposed to like more of a, a blunt base on the leaflets um, and the walnut. And the walnut also has a tooth margin just like the, um, the sumac does. And then ash actually has opposite leaves, um, but it can also be mistaken for tree of heaven because of that compound leaf structure. Um, but once again, the leaflets on there are tapering towards the base as opposed to more of a flat base. Um, and it, it doesn't typically have a, a tooth anywhere. It's usually a pretty smooth margin all the way around. All right, and now for our quick pop quiz. <laughs> so we take a moment to... Uh, Look at these photos, or any of these, or both of these, or one of them, uh, Tree of Heaven. And so if you guess <laughs> the, the one on the right is Tree of Heaven, and the one on the left is Sumac. And these are typical photos that would be submitted to IMAP and Basis. Um, one thing that really helps, you know, think about this while you're taking photos, is making sure that I can zoom in on the leaves for when I'm confirming your record. Um, so, you know, try to get up closely so you can see that one on the left is the sumac. If you look, if you squint good enough, um, you can see that I can actually see the teeth on the leaflets, um, on the margins of the leaflets. And then on the um, tree of heaven on the right, I can see that those leaf margins are smooth. And actually, on, um, if you zoomed in even further, you could even see that the, um, see some of the teeth on the uh, leaves themselves. All right, and there's an excellent research a resource that I highly recommend. The Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, MISSIN, um, has put together a collection of amazing tutorials where they walk you through individual species, and then they have a little pop quiz at the end of the, each of those um, to compare them to other species as well. And so we ask for your help. Of course, report Tree of Heaven into IMAP Invasive. And, you know, since spotted lanternfly is such an important new pest and not in New York State yet, um, if you believe you found it, we also encourage you to email the spotted lanternfly at dec.ny.gov um, and try to capture the, the insect itself 
Um, we, you know, take photos, note the location, and so forth. All right, and that's it for Tree of Heaven. I'll pass it on to Emma. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, so we are going to move over from the terrestrial realm to the aquatic realm. So this is not your water chestnut that you find in your Chinese food. This is the water chestnut that um, makes boating a real challenge. Um, so here's a photo of um, water chestnut infestation at its worst. So for those unfamiliar, water chestnut is, or um, trapanetans, um, it's a floating aquatic plant. Um, it's annual, and um, you're starting to see it emerge right about now. Um, it's starting to clog uh, our local waterways and on the Hudson and on the uh, Mohawk River. Um, it's originally from um, Asia and Europe, um, and it was actually introduced um, as an ornamental in the mid-1800s in Schenectady County, um, in Collins Park, one of our local parks here. Um, and uh, yeah, so since then it's actually spread quite rapidly across New York State. Um, so what it does, it colonate, colonizes, excuse me, these freshwater lakes and ponds, um, slow moving streams and rivers and canals. Um, and you see this kind of, oh, sorry, <laughs> I guess that's okay. Um, so what you're seeing here, the plant, what you'll see on the top, um, those upper leaves, they're kind of diamond shapes with toothed edges, and they're shiny on the upper side, and then if you flip over the leaf, you'll have, see it's kind of a duller color with fine hairs underneath. Um, they're alternatively arranged, like Jen talked about, um, and what they do, um, they have these um, kind of hollow air-filled stems or bladders that kind of keep them afloat on top of the water. Um, and so they're kind of, you know, we'll see, I think, a better picture in the next slide um, and that keep them afloat on top. Um, and they're occurring in floating clusters or rosettes, so you're going to kind of see that um, structure on top, like you see in that bottom left-hand photo. So here are the bladders I was talking about, these little, um, you know, <laughs> air pockets there that keep it afloat. Um, and this is a good photo. This is what you would look at when you're pulling the plant out kind of underneath it. So this is, you kind of see this duller color underneath. You're seeing the bladders that keep it afloat. And actually here's the nutlet, which we'll talk about in a little bit. This is kind of its um, stem here. So, so um, the submerged leaves, like I just mentioned, they um, are oppositely arranged. They're long and narrow. Um, funny enough, I think kind of the, the the submerged part actually kind of looks a little bit like another invasive Eurasian water milfoil because um, they're kind of got that feathery structure. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's kind of what it's uh, kind of like its tail. So you have that floating part with those green triangular leaves, and then you have this kind of long feathery submerged leaves. Um, the fruits I want to mention first, um, they are kind of these hard nuts. Um, they have these four inch long spines with barbs, super, super um, pointy and sharp. I do not recommend stepping on them. It will hurt like the dickens. Um, and the really insane thing about water chestnut um, nuts is that they actually can remain viable for up to 12 years which is substantial. They can survive um, for quite a while and um, re-sprout. Um, and another important thing to note too is when um, right around now, blooming in June, um, are those flowers. So you're gonna, you know, I don't think this is the key identifying feature that you need to look for, um, but you're gonna see these little white flowers right around now. Um, four petal, white, you know, kind of small on the plant. Um, and they can get pretty, pretty long. So they can be up to, the stems can be up to 12 to 15 feet long. So um, that gives you an idea too of what depth of water you kind of need to look for. So anywhere, you know, along the shoreline to, to 15 feet is where you can find these um, water chestnuts. So like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Water chestnut, when found in small populations, can, can be controlled very easily, um, you know, using, uh, you know, hand manual pulling, mechanical and chemical methods. But unfortunately, once it becomes 
um, large and robust population, it's really challenging to actually control it. So that's again why we're having you guys um, look for these kind of smaller populations. Obviously, what we do want to know where it is in the larger populations too. You know, we encourage you to report all species, all um, findings. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, when it's small, we can actually pull it and manage it, um, and it's an actual effective way of control. Um, but then as soon as you get these larger populations, you might want to invest in harvesting machines or herbicides, et cetera. But the really cool and encouraging thing, too, is we actually have a biocontrol and development. Um, so stay tuned regarding that. All right. So I know that was really quick, but I hopefully made up some time here. Um, we just want to um, kind of before we dive into the IMAP um, invasive uh, introduction, we kind of want to answer any of these species questions. We might be able to answer a few. I think I saw one on the chat. There are three on the chat. Okay. So, Jen, do you mind? Um, yeah. And I will do it really quickly. Actually, I asked Annis to maybe respond via chat for um, a more detailed one about the, the jumping worms. Um, there was a question about will the soil granules last through the winter? And how does one do a genetic analysis? And will the presentation be shared? So, um, Annis, if you don't mind responding to um, everyone in the chat box, to all attendees, um, that way they can see your answer and um, we'll um, continue on. And then there was a question about how to control these invasives. Um, so each one, of course, is going to be very different. And um, I mean, water chestnut is the one that if you catch it soon enough, um, that it's a very small population, you can hand pull it, which is amazing. Um, and you can, you know, because it's an annual plant, you just have to be persistent to try to get rid of that, that propagule that's there, um, you know, year after year. Um, but for the jumping worms and the um, tree of heaven and for larger populations of water chestnut, I would definitely refer everyone to um, talk to their local prism because they'll have local information that will be pertinent um, or their cooperative extension as well. Um, so there's lots of great resources out there. But unfortunately, we don't have time to get into the details today. All right, and I think that's all the chat questions um, that I see right now. And um, the presentation is being recorded, so um, it will be shared um, upon completion. Audrey um, with New York Invasive Species Research Institute will actually share it um, on the YouTube page. So that's NY Invasive YouTube. Um, so if you just search NY Invasive, one word, it should pop up. All right. And then with that, I will turn it over um, to Meg Wilkinson with IMAP. Great. Thank you, everyone. This is very exciting to have these three species for the challenge this year. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. If not, send a note in the chat box. <laughs> um, IMAP Invasives, as Emma mentioned, is the New York Centralized Invasive Species Database to support work of PRISM, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. It is a huge team effort across the state, and now with your participation, you are also part of this project. And we want to thank everyone for taking their time and being willing to participate in the challenge this year. Uh, Emma covered most of this. The jumping worm, we're learning the distribution, so helping researchers know where it is and where it isn't. Also, knowing where it is to know about being cautious about spreading it, um, especially for plant shares and hiking and things like that. Water chestnut, we've mentioned it's controllable manual early, which it's one of my favorites because we live right near one of those maps. We live a mile from one of those maps. We have a little pond that we've controlled for like 15 years with hand pulling. So um, it's a great one. Uh, and it's also wonderful for all of these to put in the not detected, which I'll also cover if um, that's applicable. The Tree of Heaven actually um, were in the process of adding a lot of data that was collected recently by DEC. Uh, over 10,000 records. Um, so with that one, the, the key thing is that DEC is trying to find out the full extent of Tree of Heaven in the state, as well as easy to monitor places, so parking lots and stuff like that, that they can go look for spotted lanternfly without having to hike too much. <laughs> 
um, and take too much time. This year, this is new for the challenge. Uh, we have a leaderboard, which one of our summer interns will be maintaining on a daily basis. And as Emma mentioned, there are prizes. So there'll be a prize for each individual who has the most jumping worms reported, the most tree of heaven reported, the most water chestnut reported, detected and not detected both count for the contest. And then whichever PRISM submits the most data as a whole, the PRISM leader gets to have the trophy passed to them. That's a trophy that goes from PRISM leader to PRISM leader each year. All right, so today, um, I'm kind of doing a sandwich here. So we're going to start with online, and then we're going to do mobile app, and then we're going to do online. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly and provide some resources. Um, if anyone does have difficulty at any point, you can put a quick question in that chat box. Or what I really suggest is emailing the IMAP invasives at dec.ny.gov. Um, we already have someone manning that box for the tech support hour, and we will have several. What, what did um, Lily Tomlin used to say? Callers, please stand by. We'll, operators are on duty, or you know. <laughs> so if you call during that hour um, and give us uh, your phone number to call back, and whether you're on an Android or an iPhone, um, we will be able to troubleshoot any issues that arise. Okay, um, I always like to clarify the roles of the mobile app versus the web application. So online is where the power sits. <laughs> um, you can query, you can view, you can zoom, you can put in presence and not detected and treatment data. You do need connectivity. <laughs> So, you, can, um, you know, uh, most computers would have internet. On your phone, if you have a Wi-Fi connection or you want to use your data plan, you can also use the online web application. The cool thing about the mobile app is that works offline without connectivity. So you need to have connectivity to download the app. And then you can use connect. You can use it in the middle of the Adirondacks with no connectivity. And then when you come back to a place where you have an internet hotspot, you can upload your records. So it's really quick and simple. Um, the way it's developed over the years has been impressive, and I think people are very comfortable using it. Um, and we will walk through the steps on that in detail. But in the sandwich world there, I'm starting with the online part. I also wanted to mention that um, my coverage of IMAP is New York centric. Um, we are the New York Natural Heritage Program, <laughs> but IMAP is designed to be able to be used by other states. So um, if you are interested in being, um, learning more about IMAP for a state that isn't New York. The email address there is Eric, and that's an underscore, that's very hard to read, gelhausen at natureserve.org. And if you forgot that, you could always email us and we could put you in touch. So IMAP uh, provides incredible functionality. Uh, we are only covering a small portion of the functionality in this time window today, but I wanted to make sure you know um, the mobile app is what we will focus on, and you can report presence and absence with the mobile app. Um, if anyone wants to do mobile things that are more advanced than that, email the IMAP box. We have uh, a more advanced IMAP mobile advanced, it's called, <laughs> but we're not covering that here, and that does allow for treatment and polygon work. Um, so online, you can also enter those different things, as I mentioned, and as uh, Jen mentioned on the PRISM call earlier, the email alerts just went live five days ago for the new IMAP3 system. So if you want to sign up for species for your county or your PRISM, um, you can get online and do that. Uh, so many of you may be aware 
that if you log into IMAP today, it looks very different than last year's challenge time. <laughs> we went live in April with what we call IMAP 3. It is a complete redesign of the interface and provides a lot of powerful functionality. I do want to let you know that some features are not yet live, although like I said, the email alerts just went live, <laughs> live five days ago, so <laughs> that's great. The queries are really not out. The only thing at the moment you can do is filter by species name and also the lasso tool, which I will cover. Um, you can do under that create record, you could report your invasives for the challenge online. You do not have to use the mobile app. Um, so that's available for people later on when we go back to the live. At the end of the sandwich, I will cover the identify measure and how to circle an area and get this report. And we will also cover the filter records. As I mentioned, there is a lot more functionality in IMAP than we're covering. We are focusing today on the presence and not detected, but there is treatment and searched area capabilities as well. All right, so now we're shifting in our sandwich <laughs> and we're diving into the mobile app. Um, so in the mobile app world, um, these are the things that I'm going to cover. Here's my cheat sheet. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is kind of a checklist. If you know how to take a screen um, shot easily, you could grab a screenshot of this. We're going to go over um, some things online. Most importantly, setting up your username and password. You have to do that online. You cannot do that on your smartphone. And then on the app, we'll be doing preference work and then submitting. We have a wonderful species called fake species. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone can select that and upload it, and then we'll go back online and look at it online. Check that your record went in fine and also learn how to use the filters tool. Okay, so here's where I go live and take a deep breath, everyone. <laughs> so um, I won't make seven minutes. We will be running over a few minutes. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. But <laughs> we started 10 minutes late and I had a 25 minute last So, <laughs> All right, um, let's see. So where I had things for this. Okay, so the first thing, the most important URL for you to remember is nyimapinvasives.org. Uh, you can reach us by email there, you can get resources, you can hit the login, all kinds of things. We are featuring the IMAP, uh, the 2019 mapping challenge right now, and if you click on that, there was the link for the event today, and then if you scroll down, there's also additional links, um, inf more information about the challenge, and, uh-oh, how do you solve this? Ooh, so the thing is covering my thing. Uh, I wonder if I can do that. There we go, okay. Uh, all right, um, so the very first thing is logging in. And if you had an existing IMAP2 account, it's very important to um, make sure that you now do this online you no longer have our old style username. It is now your email address. If you don't remember what email you had with your IMAP2 account, you can email us and we can check it. And if you no longer have access to that email, we can change the email address associated with your account. Um, so you can do that and do forgot password and then you have to get the email and um, accept the agreement button. If you are brand new to IMAP and did not have an existing account on the old system, you do it from the login page. There is a sign-up sheet there. 
and you can start um, fresh. So on this page, you can do the sign up page if you have never ever had an account. Okay, and then also another nice thing is this IMAP mobile app information. And we did put in stuff about how to convert your app. John, I don't know, sometimes it's just as easy to remove it and put it back in. So <laughs> if you had the app on your phone from last year, you can either update it or you can just remove it and start fresh. Okay, so that's our first piece of live. Um, and on the, um, well, actually, I'll cover that when we do this. Okay, so now I am shifting, and I am going to share from an iPad mini. Let's see how this goes. I've tested it twice. <laughs> share screen. Start broadcast. Yes. Look at that. <laughs> All right, so um, the first thing when you have gone to the App Store or the Play Store and you've downloaded your app, it will open up in Preferences. And we have a reminder again here at the top that you need to set your IMAP account online and test logging in online. You cannot set your username and password on the app. Then the next thing you want to do is select your jurisdiction. And then um, you want to enter your username and password that you've created online. The next thing I recommend people do is to press this retrieve IMAP list and you'll see a please wait. And that's a really great test to make sure you don't have a typo in <laughs> your username and password. The most common thing we find is that there's an, a space at the end of one of those um, that the um, smartphone has added in for you <laughs> because it thinks you're typing a word and then it might need a space between it and the next word. So if you get this error message <laughs> incorrect, try that first, retype your username and password. You can also double check logging in online and make sure you're remembering it correctly. Try again, hit retrieve IMAP list. You'll get the please wait. And then this is what you're looking for. If you get that green message, it means you are now set. Your username and password match online platform. The next thing I recommend people do is to create a custom species list. The number of species in the IMAP list is over 300 and a pain in the neck to scroll through in the field. So um, I personally only know about 20 invasive species, so I have made a short list of those 20. For the purposes of today, there's four I recommend you grab and you can add to your custom list later, um, other species you want. The wonderful species steak <laughs> you want and then jumping worm, and then tree of heaven, and then water chestnut. All right, so we covered the customized species. Other settings in the preferences you can set how you want later. Um, the default project and the default organization you can set if you belong to projects and organizations online. You need to make sure that you join online before you can use them in your app. And then the key thing is in the bottom left down there, you want to hit save. All right, and two other things I wanted to mention. I have found that this pops up in different places. So it doesn't matter where or when it pops up in your use of the app, but you need to allow the IMAP app access to your location or the location will not be recorded. <laughs> um, so wherever it asks you that in Android or iPhone, you have to say yes. And then you also have to allow access to the camera. And then we have a new feature with the newest release where in the past, the picture you took for the IMAP app only lived in the app. And now it also can be saved in your photos for easy reference 
later when you're not in the app and after you've uploaded your record. Okay. Oh, that's my sample picture from yesterday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I'm opening up the app. So after you save your preferences, you should get to a screen that looks like this. And it just reminds you that the menu is in the top left. You enter a new observation in the top right. If you get a number of observation cards, yellow cards, you can scroll through them. And um, to get rid of that, you just tap the screen and the little help text goes away. So now we're going to open up the ad. Okay, but it looks all right, John. Code two, GPS error. Mm -hmm. Please enable location. All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, but I will mention with that, if on the map, if under the word location, you see where it says negative 73 and lots of numbers and 42 and lots of numbers, that's good. If you see zero, zero there, that's bad. <laughs> so, um, and when you're offline, you may not see the map but you will still see those coordinate numbers. So as long as you have those nice long coordinate numbers, your GPS is being used. All right, so the species, we're going to select the fake, and you can see here I have the nice short list, easy to scroll through in the field, and I pick fake, and then I say species detected, and then if I wanted, I could put in a project or an organization if I am a member of one, you can also put in observation comments. One of the things we love to see is search effort, especially if you're reporting not detected. So if you did not find water chestnut in a pond, did you spend 10 minutes or an hour? Or did you canoe? Did you walk? And then I'm gonna say save. Okay. Um, then I'm gonna show you in case you had a number and there were many on here you wanted to do at once, the next thing we're gonna do, oh, I forgot to take a picture. Don't forget to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you submit records without pictures, it's very, 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 very hard for us to confirm it. So please include pictures. All right, now I'm gonna say select all. And then I'm hitting again this menu bars. Some people call it a hamburger. Um, the three lines on the top left and now I'm going to say upload selected and then there's um, a check are you sure you want to upload your record and you can say okay and that's what you want to see uploaded one record yay <laughs> all right and this is also what you want to see when it's done if it's successfully on IMAP it's off your phone <laughs> If you still see the cards on your phone, it did not get to IMAP. All right, now I'm gonna switch back to the share here. Yes, share. Okay, and then go back to online. Where did my Firefox go? There we go, all right. So now we were at the login page, and you want to enter that username and password, and then you will be logged in. And the first thing we're going to do, um, well, first I'm going to use, if you do the shift and drag, you can zoom to a smaller part of the map. And then I'm going to filter, so this should be fun. So this morning, um, Gabriella was kind enough to remove all the current fake species records. So now I'm gonna search on fake species and they should hopefully be some from just right now. Let's see, there's a couple, <laughs> okay. Um, Good. Anyone who wasn't able to yet submit their fake species, that um, please feel free to email the IMAP box and we'll try to help you figure that out so that you are able to be ready to go in the field. All right, then we're going to zoom into Albany. Uh, 
should be a couple in Albany. So using that search tool on the left, it zooms in. I'll minimize the filter records. And now I'm going to use this super cool tool we call the lasso tool. <laughs> um, it's under identify measure. And you pick area. And then you can draw a polygon around the information you want to look at. And you double click to end. And you get this see what's here option. And when you click on that, you um, get a report of everything in that area. Notice it has a toggle button for include hidden layers. And so the unconfirmed present is there. So is the not detected <laughs> searched area. There's a lot of things. Um, but there's my fake. Look at that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, there's fake species. Um, and we do periodically delete those. You are also welcome to delete your own fake records if you want. <laughs> um, all right, and then I'm just going to show you a couple other things. Um, you can now close this and clear the filter. I'm going to close that, and now I'm going to clear the filter. Um, and this time, I'm going to look for things in my area. So, Tree of Heaven. Actually, Heaven's easier. <laughs> there. Um, and Filter. So, before you go out, it's great to know where people have already looked for Tree of Heaven, found Tree of Heaven, where they haven't, and maybe look at the edges of that realm. Um, especially in parts of the state where we really have, I'm not going to zoom out right now, but there are gaps, as Emma showed in her, that uh, would be really great. And in the edges also, like northern Saratoga County, southern tier, places like that would be wonderful. Now I'm going to clear that and look for where is water chestnut been reported. And then I'll do, so there's some in the Hudson and there's some up there at SUNY. Um, and then I'll also do jumping worms. And the filter does only work on present species. So the not detected do not come up on the filter. You can see those when you do that very cool at this time, I should say. Um, you can see them when you do the very cool lasso tool. All right. Um, so that is a whirlwind tour <laughs> of the new interface. As I mentioned, we have lots of resources on the New York IMAP page. Um, so feel free to explore. There will also be many opportunities for in-person IMAP trainings coming up soon. Um, so please check for those. If you're really super interested also, that we have this wonderful thing that um, we have a certified trainers network and you can become a certified trainer and offer trainings for groups in your area. All right, so I believe we covered the login online, we covered the PDF, um, we set preferences, we submitted a fake record, we did the lasso tool, and we did filter. You are now ready to look for the species for this year's <laughs> challenge. <laughs> All right, as I mentioned, if you need help today, we have the one hour tech support going on. The most important thing is to tell us if you're on an iPhone or a Droid, because we have some people way more comfortable at helping people on iPhones and other people more helpful on Droids. And then if you have the ability for us to give you a call on a phone number that is not your cell phone, that can be very helpful as well. And as I mentioned, there's many resources on the um, IMAP site. And as a last, on the IMAP world, just we're always working on this invasion curve, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. It's very interesting. Water chestnut, you know, on the Mohawk River near the Twin Bridges, it's up in that zone. <laughs> but as I mentioned, you know, in some ponds, it's in the lower zone. 
jumping worm. We're not too sure where it is. And we believe we are on the low end of that curve for the spotted lanternfly. So your help with the Tree of Heaven data is greatly appreciated. Thank you.